All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back today with somebody I'm extremely excited and honored to have on the show. Uh, we've got somebody who, who's, you know, somebody who can't be described in just a few sentences, but here, we'll try it out. He's a, a Canadian-American environmentalist, animal rights activist, marine wildlife conservationist, author, uh, founder of one of the directors of Greenpeace, no matter what they say to try to water it down, he was. Um, also the founder of the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, which we'll talk about more in depth. Uh, just a wonderful human being. We have Captain Paul Watson. How are you today? Well, pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> I hope I did okay. Um, so let's just get into the the beginning. I, I kind of always am curious about some of our friends and colleagues around the world who get invested into nature and, and understanding, uh, you know, what's going on in the in natural world and why it's important. So what were your earliest memories as a kid being fascinated by the natural world? I was raised in a East Coast Canadian fishing village. So um, at a very young age, I was certainly involved uh, seaside, uh, seeing whales and dolphins and seals and that. But I think that the um, significant point in my childhood was when I was 10 years old because I spent the summer swimming with a family of beavers and had a great, great time, just me and the beavers. And uh, the, the next summer when I went back, I was quite uh, excited to see the beavers again. And uh, when I got there, I, I couldn't find them. And uh, I began to make inquiries and found out that trappers had taken all the beavers out that, that winter. They took them all. And that made me pretty angry. So that winter, or the next winter, I began to walk the trap lines and uh, free the animals and uh, destroy the traps. And uh, I guess I've been doing that for the last 60 years. Same thing. <laughs> Oh, man. It's so cool to hear that at such an early age, you could have the empathy just embedded into you to say, you know what? This doesn't seem right. I'm going to just go ahead and <laughs> circumvent this process. Well, um, I was also a member of a, a group called the Kindness Club, which was put together by a woman in uh, New Brunswick and uh, Ida Fleming. And it was a, a group to, you know, teach children to be kind to, to animals. And uh, I was part of that. And uh, when I was 25 and coming back from uh, interfering with the Canadian seal slaughter, I stopped by in Fredericton, New Brunswick to see Ida Fleming. And uh, as I was leaving, she uh, called me the the hitman for the kindness club. So that's the title of my, my last book. It was a hitman for the kind kindness club. It's a collection of stories. A lot of them from when I was a child of things that I did to protect animals. Yeah. And that hasn't changed much. You're somebody who really believes in direct action in the, in the most, you know, blatant sense, right? Well, I believe that in direct intervention and, uh, you know, in 1977, when I left Greenpeace, I, I, I developed this philosophy, which I call uh, aggressive nonviolence, to aggressively intervene, uh, to not injure anybody in the process. And in the last 60 years, I've never injured anybody, but we have intervened and shut down hundreds of illegal activities. So um, to me, it's okay to, you know, if, if, you, if you need to destroy property in order to protect a life, I think that that's uh, justified. Property can never be more important than life. And, you know, we get called a lot of names, uh, eco-terrorists or things like that. But, you know, we've never we operate within the boundaries of the law, and we also operate within the boundaries of practicality. So, for instance, if a man is about to shoot an elephant and you knock the rifle out of his hand and destroy the uh, rifle, that is an act to me, that's an act of nonviolence. You've saved a life, and uh, in doing so, you destroyed property. But property is never more important than the actual life of, a, uh, of any sentient being. Mm. There are, there are large swaths of the population who believe that somehow that's not true, and I, I just feel bad for them that they can't see that property. It's just stuff, people. Come on. Um, so were there other um, people? You mentioned Ida. Uh, were there other role models that you met along the way that really pushed you uh, and inspired you to go further? Well, not a lot of people. I mean, uh, over the years, there's a lot of people that I did uh, – or, or a few people that I, that were inspirational, people like uh, Farley Mowat, uh, who you know was a Canadian writer and naturalist, and Bob Hunter, who was uh, a co-founder with me of, uh, of the Greenpeace Foundation. And uh, but I think I probably was more seriously uh, influenced by the the animals in my life, you know, the, that I met during my life. And certainly in 1975. Uh, uh, when I, I had an experience which really changed my life, and that was uh, our first campaign with Greenpeace to um, 
to protect whales and uh, uh, a dying sperm whale could have taken my life, could have fallen down on our boat and crushed us and chose not to do so. So I certainly feel an allegiance to that, to that whale for sparing my life. But I also saw or felt at the time that uh, that whale understood what we were trying to do. And as I saw his eye disappear beneath the surface of the sea, uh, that really had a significant impact. And, and I said to myself at the time, why were the Russian whalers killing these whales? They didn't eat them. They killed them for sperm oil, spermaceti oil, which was uh, highly prized as a, uh, a very um, a good oil for heat resistance in machinery. It's probably one of the best, they said. And one of the things that it was really prized for was in the construction and maintenance of intercontinental ballistic missiles. And I said, here we are destroying this incredibly beautiful, intelligent, socially complex, self-aware sentient being for the purpose of making a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings. And that's when it struck me, oh, we're insane. We're just completely insane. And I, I said at the time that uh, I'm going to do everything I can to protect them from us. And uh, that's what I've been doing ever since. Killing something so that we can kill something else. Very yeah. human logic, if you ask me. Um, well, so three years Oh, sorry. No, I was go just ahead. Saying three years ago, I, I actually established my own church, which is a church of biocentrism, because I feel that the root cause of all of this is our anthropocentric attitudes. Every single religion on this planet is anthropocentric. That means that it all revolves around us. It was created for us. Everything that exists is created for us. We're the center of the universe. And uh, I feel that we have to replace that with a biocentric outlook, which is we're part of everything. We have to live in harmony with all other species. So my my church of biocentrism isn't really a religion. It's more of a based on science and logic, but it's also based on empathy that uh, we have to understand uh, just where we fit in and where we fit in is as part of not uh, dominant over. Well, sign me up. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like exactly what I need. Um, uh, in my experiences, it was I always had a compassion for animals, but it wasn't until I had some experiences where I was taking psychedelics. I'd take LSD and I'd look deep into the eyes of my dog, and 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 this really pushed me over the edge. Now I, I've talked to colleagues of yours. I know Rex Weiler. We, he said that this also psychedelics played a big role in his, you know, uh, appreciation for the natural world. Did that? Did that ever? Was that the case for you ever? No, I don't think so. I was never, I've never actually ever used any drugs really. Uh, you know, I've never smoked, never really was into drinking, never took a hallucinogen. Well, I did take hallucinogenics once when I was, I was uh, 19. I was uh, actually signed up to take LS, LSD 20, 125 uh, for the University of British Columbia, but it was a controlled thing where I was uh, with a psychiatrist, which is probably the worst thing that could have happened. But uh, so that was my, my, my experience. But I, I never really felt uh, attracted to, to, to psychedelics or any drugs, really. I think that probably makes it one of the reasons why you're so effective at what you do and you're so um, thorough with your convictions, I think, is that you you have that ability. I think that's an admirable quality. Um, so take me take me with um, the – obviously, you left Greenpeace a, uh, after a time. How did that end and then how did you get involved with Sea Shepherd and how did that come together? I was with Greenpeace from 72 until 77, and I was first officer on the early voyages. Um, but uh, I, I just got really frustrated in going out and hanging banners and taking pictures. And uh, I didn't want to see whales or seals or the animals that were out there. For I just didn't want to see them die. And uh, I felt that uh, there was a need to intervene. So I set up Sea Shepherd to intervene, to to get directly involved, and you know to block and to to stop, and uh, that's what we did uh, for well up until two years ago, um, and uh, then I was forced out of Sea Shepherd because uh, the people who forced me out didn't agree with that approach. They didn't agree with my philosophy of uh, aggressive nonviolence. And they said I was too controversial and too confrontational. And uh, that was basically a threat to their bottom line, which was their personal security and uh, financial and legal uh, 
problem or concerns really uh, and I, I you know recently there was an article in outside magazine where peter hammerstead who's one of the directors who forced me out he said uh, it was a little amusing in a way he says i took an oath to put my to put the financials and legal responsibilities of the organization ahead of everything else and i'm going i don't know anything about an oath i i certainly never heard about an oath but i've never would put my financial or legal responsibilities over the objective objectives of what we wanted to do which is to you know to to protect uh, our clients and our clients in the ocean that was always first and foremost no matter what the legal or the financial consequences would be do you, do you think this is typical about organizations that tr that aim to do good, but they get to some point of bureaucracy where they are just completely ineffective and then you get hijacked like this? I think it's unfortunately, I, you know, I should have seen the writing on the wall because I've seen it happen to too many organizations and, you know, especially people who are the founders of organizations being forced out of the organizations that they, they, they began because founders are always more, I think, probably more well, what radical or invested, I guess, than, than the people who come after. Uh, sea Shepherd did really well uh, until, you know, we developed our own television series, which, at the, which of course was good in many ways. That was the Whale Wars television series. But that made us, uh, that brought in a lot of supporters and therefore a lot of money. So we jumped from raising $2 million a year to $15 million a year. And then the people who uh, came in, uh, the money was, you know, they got now they got nice, comfortable jobs, and uh, that became first and foremost. That was their concern. And uh, like two years ago, when uh, they were trying to get me to step down, they uh, they offered me a lot of money. They said, "Look, we'll, we'll just pay you to be a figurehead. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to write anything. In fact, we don't want you to do anything. We don't want you to write anything. We just want you to be a figurehead." And I said, "No, I can't do that." And because I said, no, I couldn't do, they just forced me. They illegally removed me and um, and put me out. I mean, they took the assets, they took the ships, they took the list of supporters. Uh, they didn't explain to the supporters what they were doing. There was no transparency. And uh, as Alex Cornelison, who was one of the directors who forced me out, he said, people will just forget. People will understand that, uh, you know, that They'll, they'll just forget who Paul Watson was and understand that we had to do this for the uh, for the sake of, of the organization, which must come first. And, you know, the, but the organization means nothing to me. The names mean nothing to me. The logos that I designed, which they now claim to own, mean nothing to me. What means something to me is the three virtues that set Sea Shepherd apart from every other organization. And those three virtues were passion, courage, and imagination. So. They don't have that, and we do. So I'm quite confident we'll mm. recover and rebuild. Obviously, when when things start picking up with the television series and you're being broadcast on these sort of <laughs> capitalistic uh, conglomerate uh, um, uh, stations or whatever, uh, did you start to feel the tide turn in that moment that uh, here you are dancing with the devil, kind of the uh, the people who are kind of responsible for some of this uh thinking. Did you feel the tides turning then? Well, honestly, I didn't really think about it. I was more concentrating on the campaigns we had to do, and I felt that the television coverage of this would help get our message across, which it did. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. we live in a media culture, and, you know, if you don't, if you don't have... Uh, if you don't have cameras, you don't know. The, the camera is the most powerful weapon that's ever been created. And if, if nothing is real unless it's on camera in our media culture. So it was very, uh, you know, it went a long ways towards uh, stopping Japan's whaling operations in the Southern Ocean, exposing what they were doing to, to the world. So I certainly see the benefit uh, of doing that. But when it gets down to, okay, compromising on, well, you know, people are saying you're a little too radical, you're a little too uh, uh, direct action, and then, you know, and people start calling you names, and which I, for, don't bother me, but I guess it bothers some other people. You know, when people say, well, you're an eco-terrorist, my response is always, no, I never worked for Monsanto, so I'm, you know, not an eco-terrorist. I never injured anybody, but you know you have to expect that these kind of names are going to be thrown at you. I mean, back in the '90s when they started calling me a pirate, I said, "Okay, well, I'll be a pirate. I'll get my own pirate flag and do whatever you want, but I'm going to be a pirate." Uh, actually, officially, I am a, pi a pirate, a genuine bona fide pirate, because in 2014, Judge Alex Kaczynski of the Ninth Circuit Court 
uh, labeled me a pirate and said that. Uh, so officially, a federal court called me a pirate. He never charged me. I wasn't uh, arrested or anything. He just designated me as a pirate, uh, which um, I feel somewhat honored that, I, <laughs> that he gave me that designation. Uh, Kaczynski went on to be dismissed from the bar for uh, downloading pornography on the court computer and sexual harassment. So, <laughs> you know, to be called a pirate by a guy like that is probably not that much of an insult. But um, uh, but you know why, why the the pirate image is okay with me is because uh, pirates get things done. You know they cut through historically they cut through all of the red tape and the bureaucracy and got things done. When the governments like Brit Britain or France or the United States needed to get something done, who did they go to? The pirates. John Paul Jones. The founder of the United States Navy was a pirate. Uh, you know, Jean Lafitte was a pirate. Uh, so many, uh, you know, Henry Morgan was a pirate, and they got things done. And people say, well, they, you know, they they were they were they were bad. And I said, well, why were they bad? I said they were way ahead of their time. Uh, they had uh, sexual and uh, racial equality. You know, they didn't care what your race was or your gender. Or you could serve on the crew. Uh, they uh, democratically elected their their captains they, uh, and their officers. That was well way ahead of everything else. And it comes right down to, well, what's so bad about them? Well, they were robbers. Ah, they stole gold. And where did they steal the gold from? The Spaniards. And where did the Spaniards get the gold? They stole it from the Indians. So don't give me that. You know. So, <laughs> but in a world, in a world, uh, hypocrisy. Where, in a world where a ten year old boy could be hung in London for stealing a loaf of bread. It wasn't a big jump to risk your life to, uh, to go for, you know, to go for whatever they were going. And Bonnie, the, you know, the most uh, famous uh, female pirate of all, uh, was asked one time, you know, she said it was a death penalty for being a pirate. And her answer was, thank God for that too, because if it wasn't for that, every idiot would be doing this. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and you know abolitionists and the you know the American Revolution. These are people that defied authority, and, and, and at some point, what, isn't that effective? And it seems like they're crying as if, you know, crying about a barber and saying, "Well, it would be nice if he wouldn't cut the hair because it's too violent." Like that's what you do. You're supposed to be intervening uh, and being active in the thing that you're doing. And if you're going after people that are illegally fishing or whaling or shark finning and stuff, um, if you're effective. Isn't that the point? I've never been convicted of a felony crime in my entire history. And so all this is just real talk. Um, so it doesn't really concern me. How about oh, 14 years ago, I was invited by the FBI to give a talk. They actually paid me to come and give a talk at Quantico on eco-activism and whatever. And uh, at the after the talk, one of the FBI agents said, uh, well, you know, Sea Shepherd's walking a pretty fine line when it comes to the law. And my answer to him was, so who cares how fine the line is? We didn't cross the line. So if you don't cross the line, what's wrong with that? And he had to agree with me. But then he came out and he said, yeah, but some of your crew have gone on to become eco-terrorists. And I'm going, really? Who? And he said, well, Rod Coronado, he's a eco-terrorist. I said, Rod Coronado? Uh, he, he, he freed some mink from a mink farm. Is that what you call eco-terrorism? Is that, is that the, big, the big problem here? And I said, besides, he did that five years after he left my crew. So uh, it had nothing to do with me. And uh, he said, yeah, well, you trained him. You're responsible. And I couldn't resist. I said, really? Well, let me give you four names. Timothy McVeigh, Lee Harvey Oswell, Osama Bin Laden, Muammar Gaddafi. You trained them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you did. The American government did. The Mujahideen. Yeah, you betcha. Um, so are there other organizations that are doing good things on behalf of animals now that you also are in contact with or that you appreciate from a distance? Well, there's a lot of organizations doing a lot of good things. Uh, you know, the... You know, I, I don't want to really list some and not list others and everything, but uh, the strength of sure. any movement, the, the strength of any movement is uh, in diversity, diversity of approaches. So that uh, approach might be litigation, it might be legislation, it might be uh, education, it might be direct intervention. It all works towards the same thing. So I, I don't want to judge one over the other. Uh, I, I do have a problem with organizations that are hypocritical. That is that they say things and do just the, do, do just the opposite. But but uh, you know, that's unfortunate. That's what Sea Shepherd has become. You know, it's it's now just posing. It's not doing anything um, that 
certainly not in the spirit of what we originally uh, were, began. Now they're afraid to do anything because they're, you know, they're afraid they might upset their corporate or their government partners. And once you partner with governments and corporations, you pretty much have lost your soul. Agreed, a hundred percent. You said uh, partners. I would say overlords, but uh, you know. <laughs> well, for instance, I never, um, ever, I never ever thought for a moment that Sea Shepherd would partner with the Austral Fishing Company and the Marua Daichiro Fishing Company of Japan. They actually have a partnership with them, and now where we were totally opposed to the uh, to fishing, absolute totally opposed to fishing, they now come out and say, "Well, these are sustainable fishing." There's no sustainable fishing in our oceans. That doesn't exist. So th that kind of compromising is something that uh, was one of the reasons that I'm no longer with Sea Shepherd. You know, we've so, lost something like 60% of the sharks. Yeah, I have to I have to say when I say no longer with Sea Shepherd, I do still work with Sea Shepherd France and Sea Shepherd Brazil. Those are the two groups that refuse to, uh, you know, compromise their principles. And so I uh, you know, it's, it's a bit of a complicated situation, but uh, those two countries I still continue to work with. And Sea Shepherd UK became the Captain Paul Watson Foundation UK. So in there, the, we still have that mm -hmm. group. And thankfully, because of that, uh, you know, I was able to continue to go forward. Yeah, it, it, obviously, this is a really difficult time. Are there colleagues that you've have completely turned on you? Was it a full mutiny in the sense that there are people out there that uh, really stabbed you in the back that you thought you were your friends? In August of 2022, uh, we had uh, what we called Sea Shepherd Global. Now, Sea Shepherd Global was not set up to control Sea Shepherd. I set Sea Shepherd up as a movement, not as an organization, a movement of independent entities, whether it be France or Germany or the UK or New Zealand, Australia, they're all independent. But we set up Sea Shepherd Global to coordinate the ships and the campaigns. That was the sole purpose for it. That was in 2013 that we did that. In 2022, there were six directors and uh, Lamia, Esam Lamia and myself were two of those six directors. In August of 2022, four of those directors held a meeting without inviting us. And at that meeting, they dismissed me and uh, didn't tell me about it until September 2nd when I received an email saying, you're dismissed from the global board without any explanation. And they've never spoke to me ever since. And when Lami Esam Lami questioned this because she wasn't invited to the meeting, she received an email saying, you're hereby dismissed from the Sea Shepherd Global Board. And then this global board, which was never meant to control anything, then decided that it would control all the other entities. Now, we went to court just recently uh, on this in Holland, and the Dutch court ruled that, yes, the dismissal was illegal, but didn't do anything about it. So they still get to get away with it. <laughs> So we have another court case on that because now they're trying to claim that the name that I created belongs to them and the logos that I designed belongs to them. They're trying to say that they actually created those logos. So we had to go to court with all the historical references to show that that wasn't true. And these four men are people that I actually brought into the organization who I trusted. And uh, so, yeah, it was quite a shock when they, 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 they did this. And like I said before, Peter Hammerstead, who, who is one of them, he said, well, you know, my obligation is to the organization and not to Paul Watson. And I'm going, yeah, precisely. But, you know, your obligation should have been to the movement and to the values of the movement, not to some entity that was set up only for the sole purpose of controlling uh, ships and campaigns, not, not, not controlling everything else. Now have these sniveling Cretans... Uh pardon my French, uh, released a statement uh, explaining any of this? Nope, they refuse to explain it. Uh, we've challenged them to debate it publicly. Uh, their tactic is to say nothing, to explain nothing. And uh, they're losing support, of course. Uh, when people find out what's going on, they come over and they support me. But uh, they control all the, the lists of names. And, uh, and by refusing to explain themselves, they feel that this can go on. Alex Cornelison actually said to Lamy Asim Lamy, he said, oh, people will forget. People always forget. And um, Peter Hammerstead made this silliest remark. He said, well, look what the World Wildlife Fund and all the bad things they do and people still support them. So I'm sure that we'll continue to get support. That is 
this shame? Well, you know, we're here to say uh, you have a new organization that has your name on it, which would be harder to hijack. Uh, what's the name of the new uh, foundation that you got? Well, after being ousted from a Sea Trevor Global, I set up the Captain Paul Watson Foundation. It made me a little uncomfortable to do that, but uh, I set it up so that that's a name they can't really take away from me or nobody can take away from me. At some point, I'll probably just call it the foundation. But we're also fighting to gain, regain control of Sea Shepherd with Sea Shepherd France and Sea Shepherd Brazil. So it, it, it makes it a little complicated because we still, you know, still working with Sea Shepherd name in those two countries and everything. But uh, we'll see where it goes from there. But uh, right, the first thing, what happened as soon as I left, I, uh, you know, I had nothing, no ships, nothing and everything. But I get a call from uh, one of our longtime supporters, Jean-Paul de Joria, who is uh, the founder of Paul Mitchell Shampoos and uh, Patron uh, Tequila. You know, he's a, he's a very wealthy businessman, a self-made uh, billionaire, really, because he, he was a homeless man at one point. <laughs> and um, he he calls me up and said, because he had already sponsored a small boat, but they, which they scrapped. They scrapped all our boats. So, and that. and um, he said, uh, what happened to the boat? And uh, I said, they scrapped. And he, they, and he called them up and said, why'd you do that for? And they said, well, I was getting old and we decided to scrap it. And he said, why didn't you give that boat to Paul? And they said, well, we offered it to him and he refused. And I said to JP, uh, John Paul, I said, no, I never even spoke to them, so they certainly didn't offer it me. So he said, uh, "Okay, find me a find me a ship, and I'll buy it." So I did, and I found a ship, a uh, former Scottish Fisheries Patrol boat, and that, that's now the John Paul de Joria, and uh, that's our ship, and it's a great ship, and uh, he's our primary backer on that. But we're also, you know, a lot of people came over. You know, I got the support of the of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and uh, a lot of celebrity supporters, and a lot of uh, long time supporters, and 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 they're and, and we're getting strong every day. They're getting weaker every day, but we're getting stronger every day. Uh, because I think that they've made a big mistake. They cannot, Sea Shepherd cannot survive uh, as being a mediocre, non-controversial, afraid to do anything organization. They have to be able, you have to be able to risk everything uh, in order to be successful. And that's what we're going to do. And that's what, he, what we isn't have. Isn't that been. the, yeah. And isn't that the appeal for the people who give the money to you to, in order to do something is that they expect you to be sort of direct and, and effective? Yes. So all we have to do really is recapture their uh, attention because a lot of people think that Sea Shepherd is still continuing to do what Sea Shepherd's all, always done. So, uh, you know, in June of this year, we'll be taking on the uh, Icelandic whaling ships. And uh, it's my objective to make sure they don't kill any whales. And I'm sure it'll be pretty confrontational. And I think that that will probably capture a lot of people's attention when, when, when we do that. When you go into a confrontation with a whaling fleet, you have to be prepared to lose your ship. You have to be prepared to be arrested. You have to be prepared for all of the possible consequences of that kind of confrontation. And uh, we are. So I'm sure that we'll be successful on that. Last June in 23, we were prepared to take on the Icelandic whaling fleet. We arrived in Icelandic waters in on June 19th of 2023. And the very day we arrived, the government of Iceland put a temporary ban on, on whaling. Uh, but unfortunately, the whaling fleet in Iceland is controlled by the most powerful and influential and wealthiest man in Iceland, a man named Christian Lawson. And he has the power to take down the government of Iceland if he doesn't get his way. And he's demanding a five-year permit. Mm -hmm. And uh, it looks like uh, he's got control of the enough politicians in order to do that. So we're we're watching it carefully. We'll be there, and uh, if he comes to, tries to get out with his two ships, we'll block them. That is so disgusting. How I mean, you've had run-ins with a lot of these Japan and Iceland and a lot of these. What what has been the most uh, enraging sort of? Uh, interaction that you've had with either governments or fishing vessels or bureaucracy? Oh, God, there's been so many of them. <laughs> uh, the Japanese have been <laughs> What Japan's doing is blatantly, blatantly illegal. In fact, Australia and New Zealand took them to the International Court of Justice and got a ruling against them, but they still continue to do it anyway because the International Court of Justice has no power to do anything. It just puts out a pronouncement and everybody just continues to ignore it, as we see in so many cases. Um, so what happened with uh, the Japanese is that uh, we were successful in stopping them, cutting down their quotas every year till in the last year I was there, 2020. 
2012 and 2013, they uh, they only took 10% of their quota. And we saved overall the time we were there 6,500 whales. We were becoming, you know, as extremely effective. So what Japan did was that they had uh, me placed on the Interpol Red Notice uh, on the charge of conspiracy to trespass. Now, the Interpol Red Notice is for serial killers, major war criminals, and uh, major drug traffickers. Nobody gets on there for trespass, but that shows you the pol political power that, that Japan has. So I was charged with conspiracy to trespass, and what that effectively did was prevent me from um, traveling. Uh, you know, I was really restricted to traveling only bet between the U.S. and France because both those countries wouldn't recognize that. But what that goes back to 2012 when I arrived in Germany. I was arrested by the Germans and uh, held under uh, first in prison, then under house arrest. And then when I found out they were going to deport me to uh, Japan, I escaped from Germany. Uh, they held both my passports, but I had no papers. But I got to the coast of the Netherlands, and Lamia and Lamy from France got, got me on a sailboat, and I sailed across the Atlantic, landed in Nova Scotia, went ashore at night, then crossed into the U.S., crossed the United States, reboarded one of our vessels off of Catalina Island, took that boat to American Samoa, then boarded my ship to Sea Shepherd, went down and confronted the Japanese one for more time, and then came back and then spent the next six months in exile in the South Pacific, Vanuatu, Tonga, or the Great Barrier Reef, until finally John Kerry uh, gave me permission to come back into the United States on the grounds that this whole thing was ludicrous and, uh, and I was able to return to the U.S. But I can't go. I haven't been able to go to Canada because Prime Minister Trudeau said that he would see that I was extradited to Japan if I crossed the border. These stories give me goosebumps, Skip. I'm 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 on the edge of my seat. I can't believe that people like you exist. Thank God that you exist. Now, has the John Kerry was nice enough to be diplomatic to you? Have have people have governments been um, turning on you as well as the Sea, sea Shepherd in, in recent years? Are they getting more anti whatever eco? Well. You know, we do have, you know, good relations with the French government, the U.S. government, I guess. Uh, I, w I wouldn't say good relations. The, United, the U.S. just doesn't bother us. But uh, but uh, in the French government, we're actually more cooperative. We're working closely with them. But uh, And I have no problem with working with governments. I work with Ecuador. Uh, you know, I actually got the Amazon Peace Prize from the president of Ecuador for our work in, in the Galapagos. I have no problem with working with governments. And But the problem with Sea Shepherd now is that they not just work with governments, they basically do what the governments tell them to do. And, uh, you know, the, the governments have to uh, go over their – their uh, every press release has to be, uh, you know, okayed uh, on and on and on. So it's, it's very uh, – you know, basically they're controlled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for, for what reason is the real question? I mean, I'm vegan and I've been vegan now for a while. Uh, it seems to me that some of the things like you mentioned that they were using the oil because it makes a good whatever industrial lubricant or whatever, is is it really necessary to fish and destroy uh, marine life like we have been doing still to this day? No. It, 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 well, the problem is, is that if, in 2015, I called for a global moratorium on commercial industrialized fishing. And uh, for at least 75 years, because uh, if we carry on doing this way, there won't be any fishing industry because there won't be any fish. And we're literally pulling everything out of the ocean. Uh, and can you really call yourself an environmentalist if you aren't vegan? Is the question. Well, I guess you could, but, you know, it, there is a lot of hypocrisy in, 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 involved in that. But, uh, you know, but I think it's a, something that has to be recognized that the slaughter of 90 billion animals a year, primarily on factory farms, is the most significant contribution to global greenhouse gases, the most significant contribution to groundhouse groundwater pollution, the most significant contributor to dead zones in the ocean. And so, yeah, uh, you know, there is a direct connection. I had Rex Weiler on the program and I threw him under the bus and I said, are you vegan? He said, no. And I said, shame on you. <laughs> shame yeah. on you, Rex. Well, all my ships have been um, vegan ever I, since, uh, since 2000. Prior to that, they were vegetarian. Hmm. That's incredible. That's incredible. Um, so as we go along with humanity and we start finding out that the, the you know, the environmentally friendly group, we you guys were right that we're destroying the planet and now we have climate change. It's this big existential crisis. Do you feel a little bit more vindicated in all the things that you've tried to been telling people over the years? Do you feel like 
People are coming well, around. I don't feel vindicated at, at all, really. I, I, I don't really look uh, – to the future much. You know, I learned a very important lesson back in 1973. I was a medic for the American Indian Movement uh, during the occupation of Wounded Knee. And we were surrounded by U.S. federal troops who were shooting at us. Uh, they, you know, they killed two wounded 46. And uh, I went to Russell Means, who was the leader of the American Indian Movement at the time. And I said, look, we don't have any hope of winning here. We're outnumbered. The odds against us are overwhelming. So what are we doing here? And uh, his response to me stayed with me for the rest of my life. He said, well, we don't care about the odds against us, and we're not concerned about winning or losing. We're here because it's the right thing to do, the right place to be, and the right, thing to, the right time to do it. He said, don't worry about the future. You have no control over the future. You can, your control is in the present. What you do in the present will define what the future will be. So I don't get depressed or I don't get pessimistic about the future because I know I don't have any control over it. All I can do is focus on what I do, and uh, what I do is uh, in the present. God, that is the be most beautiful nugget of wisdom I've heard all, all week. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about what happened at Wounded Knee? I know that there was a there was a shootout with the FBI, right? Yeah, the town was occupied uh, by the American Indian Movement to uh, bring attention to the uh, the Fort Laramie Treaty of uh, 1868, which was violated, of course, as every other treaty was. And uh, the Nixon administration wasn't going to have anything to do with that, so they sent federal agents to, to put an end to it. And so the siege of Wounded Knee lasted for about two months, where we held off against the U.S., and we created the independent Oglala Nation of Wounded Knee. Uh, and so it was largely symbolic. You know, Russell Means and Dennis Banks and that were arrested, and Russell was shot. And then Russell did something, and Dennis Banks did something, which was brilliant. Uh, they became movie actors and movie stars, uh, like in you know, Last of the Mohicans or whatever. And in America, of course, if you're a movie actor, that makes you almost untouchable because now you're part of the arist ar aristocracy, no matter what you've done. And uh, he was able to carry on uh, and doing what they do. But, you know, in a way, you have to get that celebrity status to protect yourself or otherwise you're just expendable. Hmm. Do you feel like you have that at this point? No, not really, but <laughs> somewhat uh, in certain places. Uh, you know, I'm I'm pretty well known in France and that, but uh, uh, I don't really think about it that much. <laughs> Do you have enough comrades worldwide that you feel like you can continue on with your organization until, you know? Forever? Well, yeah, I think so. Uh, like, um, you know. There's a lot of people I've worked with over the years, on little, literally um, hundreds of people who are doing a lot of things. Uh, you know, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals was actually established by one of my crew members. And uh, there's been many cases, uh, many organizations that were founded by, by, by people who crewed with me. Wow. And what does it take to get to get on a crew for you? I'm asking for myself. When can I come and <laughs> well, anybody, anybody volunteer? Can volunteer. Anybody can volunteer, and uh, you know, then we coordinate the um, the time and the place and what, wherever you know. Because sometimes it's a commitment of two weeks, sometimes it's a commitment of three months. So it it depends. Has there ever been moments of? I mean, obviously, this is potentially dangerous work. Has there ever been uh, people going overboard, or, or accidents, or intentional nope. deaths? Anything? We've never, we've never had anybody injured. Certainly not killed. We've never had anybody injured. Well, then you're not much of an eco terrorist, I have to say. Oh yeah. Well, you, all you have to do is hold the protest <laughs> up in front of an abattoir, and you're an eco terrorist these days. You know, I mean, it's against the it's against the law in the in the United States to take a picture of a farm, for God's sake. So you know, that's that's under right. the animal, that's called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. You know. So all you have Ag to do is laws where, yeah, all you have to do is disappoint, uh, uh, disagree with the government, and you become an uh, you become a uh, eco terrorist. In fact, in the United States, if you cost any industry more than ten thousand dollars in losses, then you become an eco terrorist. Hmm. Well, then I'm a proud criminal. I don't really, I don't mind so much. Uh, do you think that the uh, it's legislation or policy? Is it moving in our direction, or are we are we fucked? I think it's getting more repressive all the time, and certainly the th you know the things that we used to do in the past we can't do anymore because the laws are becoming much more more oppressive. So it really requires a lot more imagination, a lot more courage now than 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 ever before. 
Yeah, so it's it's a difficult situation. You know, when I was born, there's three billion people on the planet. Now there's eight billion people on the planet. So, uh, it, you know, when is that going to end? Uh, Twelve billion, fourteen billion? What does it, you know? The, the planet just simply can't sustain that number. Uh, I always yeah. said, you know, this planet was never meant to sustain eight billion meat eating, fish eating uh, primates. Uh, it's an out of the natural order of things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you have any advice for somebody like me who's a misanthrope who would just prefer to curl up in the bottle in the bottom of a bottle of scotch uh, that I see what's going on in hum with humanity? I'm not impressed. And we're, we're you know, we're facing so much. And I know we talked before and you also share this feeling like, I don't know which direction is going to go. What would you tell a young person that still is idealistic? I think that you follow your passion. You do what you're passionate about. It doesn't matter if what, what, what you're, but use your skills really. Whether you're an artist or a lawyer or whatever, use your skills to try and make a to, to make a, make a difference. But also keep in mind that we all, each and every one of us, has the power to change the world, uh, and we've seen it in so many cases. I mean, because of Diane Fossey, we still have mountain gorillas in Rwanda, for example. Uh, so you know, we have that power. And but the most important thing is to never let anybody deter you. Ever, never let anybody say you can't do it. Uh, be true to your well. You, the passion within yourself. Hmm. Well, my passion is dwindling every day that I read the news. So we're, we're trying our best over here. I do what I can. I encourage everybody to go vegan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you've written a couple of books. Can you talk about some of the books that you've written? Uh, my last book was A Hitman for the Kindness Club, but I've also written Ocean Warrior, uh, uh, you know, Seal, uh, Seal Wars, Whale Wars, all the, the uh, books. I write books on history, books on poetry. I write children's books. I've got a book last year called uh, uh, We Are the Ocean, which is for children. I, I really like writing the children's books. And, uh, you know, I wrote, I wrote a history book, which is The War That Saved the Whales, and that was based on the, uh, the Civil War. If it wasn't for the Civil War, three species of whales would now be extinct, but people don't realize that uh, the uh, Confederacy launched uh, Confederate Raiders, which uh, totally annihilated the Yankee whaling fleet. You know, and I'm not, I'm not saying the Confederacy was good, but what they did do, in <laughs> what they did was just in destroying the uh, Yankee whaling fleet certainly was the reason those three species of whales did not go extinct. And I learned a lot from them wow. because that Captains uh, Raphael Semmes and Captain uh, Waddell of the, of the of the Confederate Raiders Shenandoah in Alabama, they never killed anybody. You know, they they didn't kill a single person, and and they shut down the entire uh, Yankee whaling fleet. And uh, so I learned a lot from that how to how approach it. And you know, we you can wage a war without killing people.